Hello, everyone. Welcome to Todd Talks. And today we're taking a very deep dive into Icewind Dale. Rhyme of the Frostman is available right now on D&D Beyond. You should go check it out. It's one of the, I don't know that I've ever been this excited for an adventure. Um, I think it's so unique. It has such a uh, wonderful, you can kind of go anywhere. I mean, every D&D every &D adventure is kind of open world, right? Mm -hmm. So, but this is very open world. You have uh, lots of choices. We've got a lot of secrets to tell you today, but uh, if you want my uh, opinion on Rem the Frostmaiden, uh, you know, in a tweet length <laughs> soundbite, it's uh, it perfects the formula that uh, Tomb of Annihilation and Storm King's Thunder uh, first put in place. So, uh, I think it's I think it's a very fun adventure. Uh, now, if you're watching right now, uh, do you bear in mind there are going to be some minor spoilers, potentially some medium spoilers. We're going to try to not be too spoilery, but we are definitely doing kind of an analysis of this adventure in Taw Talks today, uh, especially for you Dungeon Masters out there that are thinking of running this for all your players. If you're a player and you're scared of ruining uh, this really awesome adventure, please look away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but encourage we'll, your dm to buy the book <laughs> <laughs> so. we'll tell you before any really big spoilers come up so uh maybe maybe tease yourself a little bit here what what do you like because you've written several adventures you've worked mm -hmm. on several books mm -hmm. what uh, what the, uh, how does this appeal to you the most mm. like, because it, it does feel very differently constructed it, it almost reminds me of being handed a TV show Bible for like a supernatural show like X-Files in a way. Uh, right. Yeah. So if you've read Tomb of Annihilation, the adventure that takes place in the jungles of Chult, you'll find the structure of this adventure, I think, rather familiar. It starts in uh, a settlement in uh, Tomb of Annihilation that was Port Nianzaru. In this book, it's 10 towns, which are really 10 settlements, uh, all kind of loosely uh, collated together. And then it moves on to the broader expanse in Tomb that was the Jungles of Cholt. Here it's the Wastes of Icewind Dale uh, with a number of encounters, both random and planned, that your characters can kind of butt heads with as they explore. A lot of free roaming, free world exploration here. And then as, and that sort of, that exploration kind of weaves in and out of the story. And then all of the later chapters are uh, deep dives into specific either story events or story focused locations um, that all kind of gain momentum and tension as they barrel towards a climactic conclusion. Um, I think Tomb of Annihilation had a bit of a, a challenge with it, and that was the death curse, which was mm -hmm. a very cool idea, but it put this sort of ticking clock uh, that made you really want to get to the end and not want to explore too much. Um, that's, that's, very, a, very, that's a complaint very I've heard point. before. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. Like you, you are you have been given this mission statement. Like you know, the, yeah. the end of the world is nigh. It's hard to drop by a tavern and you know have a yeah. side quest. I mean, you're losing one maximum hit point every single day. If you dally too long, you've just got you, you've got nothing. You're dead permanently. No resurrection. <laughs> yeah, here. Oriel the Frost Maiden, uh, the lesser god of, of winter and ice, has placed a curse upon Icewind Dale that causes the sun to never rise. And this is causing environmental havoc, right? If there's no sun, everything's kind of going out of control. But this curse has been going on for about two years now. Even though things are really bad, they're not going to get much worse in the immediate term. Sure, if this curse isn't broken in another year or two, there will be some utter ecological collapse, civilization will fall apart, all sources of food will die, that sort of thing. But you're not on that sort of ticking clock immediately. So you mm -hmm. have a bit of freedom to explore at your own leisure. Um, and that, that interweaving between free exploration and driven plot is a real strength of this book. I, I love that. Yeah, you still get that global threat, mm -hmm. right? Like this adventure matters. You've got yeah. to solve this. But yeah, the, the fact that like the world will not end necessarily... In the next that's, four adventures. <laughs> that's a really interesting thing about this adventure, too, is that if you look at other adventures like uh, Tyranny of Dragons, for instance, Tiamat, uh, another another goddess who wants uh, a terrible devastation upon the world. If Tiamat is not stopped, there are good odds that the entire world is screwed. Um, in this adventure, uh, Oriel's goals are, are very localized. She cares a lot about Icewind Dale, and she's not too interested in the rest of the world, which gives us a very sort of uh, despite its wild sort of, you know, divine plot, 
Uh, mm -hmm. it, it still feels very grounded because it's su su such a tight location. It kind of removes some of that wondering, like, well, why doesn't Elminster just handle this for us? If this, if there are so many high-level NPCs running around, why don't they just do it all? Well, it's because they might not have noticed. This is a small, small-scale threat that is perfect for adventurers like you to handle. That, that's oh, that's that yeah, that's that's perfect because you know the limitation of being in like a major city like Waterdeep, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, like, well, at what point? do these giant powerful npcs not insert themselves into the situation yeah well, this is just too far away maybe and like you said they don't even know it's happening mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that's the scarier threat right like to mm -hmm. that's the essential in horror is that you are the you are yes. the heroes it's up to you and you know you might not may not make it out of this like <laughs> but you still have those stakes and that's why i think the thing as a movie always worked really well um is that it is that fear of like, well, we're just a couple of people, but we have to make sure this doesn't get out because yeah. that's the end of things. That's the end of times. Um, so let's let's dig in a little bit. Like, how do how do they how do they go about making us care about ten towns? Because this is a mistake I often make. Sometimes I'll make a I'll make kind of like a series of uh, towns be too rough and tumble or too rude, and then people are like, you know what? I'm okay with all all these people <laughs> dying. <laughs> how do you, uh, how do how do we breathe life into ten towns? This is kind of my my number one of the the ten things that I I like to dig into about this book. Ten towns is the first chapter of this book, and it takes up about a hundred pages in the physical product. Um, they spare no expense lavishing detail upon 10 towns. Um, and every one of these towns is equipped with a couple of points of interest um, and at least one quest. Uh, I found that D&D books in the past have kind of shied, uh, shied away from this is a quest, this is a thing, and kind of, kind of like the, the, the video gamey way. But in a sandbox adventure like this, I think the clear delineation of this is someone who wants you to do something is actually very, uh, very useful. It gives you something to grab onto and do, so you're not just kind of wandering aimlessly. Uh, Every one of these towns is a quest. Every one of these towns is a problem and its own personality and people you can get interested in um, with various quirks and traits. And uh, in addition to all of that, there are two starter quests that uh, the DM can pick from to give you an in with all of these 10 towns. And these quests, uh, will uh, are, they aren't just localized to the town you get them in because this is a broad sandbox adventure, the goal of these of these quests is largely to uh, push you out of your 10 towns comfort zone and into the wider world, into the wilderness, but also into other towns. And so as you have you know, one quest that may start in Bryn Shander, uh, you may be pushed to uh, go all the way down the road passing through Kaer Dineval, through Kaer Koenig. Um, and that puts you in immediate contact with other NPCs who you may come to love, with other villains who you may come to hate, and with other quests too. Um, so you may have a, a little bit of that feeling where you've like, I've, I've just passed through town. I've got a lot of things tugging me in a lot of directions. And now I've got to make a choice. Who do I help? And what can I do? Um, it doesn't entirely not remind me of Ravenloft and, and how quickly you can invest in a small population. Mm. Right? Yeah. Many of these like, 10 towns only have a population of 50 or a hundred people. Right. I could, I could see an entire, like this almost as a setting because it has such a yeah. uni unique flavor to it. I could easily see myself not unlike descent into Avernus though. I don't think you'd want to just live in Avernus <laughs> for like 20 levels. Yeah. But like Icewind Dale, I'm like, maybe this maybe this is where you went to, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that three days of night kind of feel of like you, you've gone to this far remote town because this is where you are. I mean, well, if you did set up an inn, what if you did set up a business, <laughs> you know, looking for like artifacts or something yeah. like that? You and I discussed a lot of creepy things one could be doing in the 10 towns. <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> of creepy stuff. Um, there are ghosts and possessions. There are Dwergar lurking invisibly among the people. There are cultists of the archdevil Levistus hiding behind uh, secret doors. You know, uh, every one of these ten towns has their own secret. Some of them are supernatural. Some of them are are terribly mundane, but still mm. creepy. Um, 
and it, the you really feel the different flavor with every uh, with every town you go to, and I think uh, it, it it might be a little bit a bit challenging. It might be a, a fresh and new challenge for DMs to really stress those differences and make every one of the ten towns feel like a different place. Um, th this brings me to kind kind of a, a, a one and a half point that I want to touch on real quick, and it's advancement. Um, uh, I know that a lot of people have talked about uh, the way you gain levels in Dungeons and Dragons adventures, and there's typically two ways of doing it. There's milestone leveling, where when you reach a story point, you gain a level, uh, and that's kind of sort of ad hoc, arbitrary by the DM or the adventure. Um, or there's XP leveling where you kill enough stuff or you uh, gain enough XP, then you level when you reach a certain threshold. This book does a very interesting job of kind of squishing the two together, sort of. It links advancement to so the, the, the completion of quests and gives oh. the DM a uh, sort of broad authority to ad hoc. Well, what you did now is kind of equivalent to one of these quests too, so you can gain a level here now. Um, and this like propels the sandbox forward. Once you've done enough work around 10 towns, it's kind of clearly understood that you've grown beyond this. And now you can uh, explore this entire frozen wasteland of Icewind Dale without too much fear of just being curb stomped by and, a frost giant wandering by. And this is a very video game kind of thing to do, right? <laughs> like you finished your quest and here's your experience. I actually rather like that quite a bit. Like, you know, because I, you know... I'm far removed from the days where I used to hand out XP for monsters because mm. that did kind of encourage a certain mentality when it came to hunting down monsters, <laughs> <laughs> like big game. Um, what's exciting about this too is like the consequences matter. Like not only are we talking like on a global scale, but you can do things or not do things that may cause the city itself without giving away too much to be in peril these towns yes this adventure has really serious consequences um i i think that uh breaks free of uh the kind of video gamey nature of the open world where the world has kind of been a uh, a placid state until you start messing with it this world is constantly in motion in certain places there are certainly some spots that are kind of everything has happened and then you show up and things spring to life a little bit because uh a dm handling all of those moving parts at once becomes a little overwhelming but there are very specific portions that move kind of of their own accord and actions that you have in the earlier chapters of the book come back to haunt you potentially in a huge way later on. Um, there uh, are very big <laughs> entities at play. Yeah, without spoiling too much, you've seen the gigantic miniature that people have uh, trotted out for, for this adventure, the huge chonky boy. Um, and... Uh, Without yeah. spoiling too much, that that guy can, if you make some bad decisions, can ruin the lives of a lot of people really fast. If it looks scary, <laughs> it is scary in in this book. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> in Icewind Dale, um, and and, and the book gives you guidance on that. It's not just yeah. ad hoc. Uh, you know, maybe maybe some bad stuff happens. It it with honestly kind of uncomfortable detail it tells you yeah, half the population of this town will die if you aren't there to help them it's like oh <laughs> crap <laughs> okay it's a lot and like if you fail do you want to keep on playing that character who failed like the, 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 there's yeah. some real stakes yeah. right like I, I i've stopped playing characters who did who did fail yeah and it was so bad <laughs> like and it's not on my dm at all it's just like wow that's the, how the that's how the dice fell yeah, that that stuff that uh, an adventure can't uh, can't account for, right? The, that's stuff that a player has to bring to the character. The adventure sets up all these circumstances, but then then it's on you, right? Then you can see what happens in your own psychology and your own quest for redemption, sort of stuff. Uh, and, and before we move on, there is something that needs to be said. Uh, the artwork in this book is <sighs> astounding. Yes, I, I think it it sums up what this book is about in so many wonderful ways you have these giant large pieces of art and you often have you know people huddled around each other with torches you've got you just get that sense of yeah. this environment and i don't know that i've ever played a D, &D uh, book or had a D, D book that quite illustrated it to this extent i feel like this is a real world yeah um because it's like i feel like someone's literally taking photographs right yeah. of these environments at distance and and, and that somehow lends a, a sense of realism to some stuff that is absolutely surreal yeah there <laughs> so. 
I, I was in um, uh, an art direction meeting for something different with Chris Perkins around the time that the art for this book was being finalized. Um, and he talked very highly about Wizards art director, Kate Irwin, who did an amazing job uh, sort of presenting uh, freelancers with briefs for this art. Um, and there's one kind of remarkable thing that you'll notice about all this art when you really look close to it. And it's that all of these people, whenever you see people in this art, for the most part, they are huddled up. They are in furs and in masks so thick you cannot see their face. This is a land of eternal darkness. So the, the color schemes are often muted and, and uh, well, I, I, I want to say lifeless, but these, this art is nevertheless bursting with life and character, yeah. which is a, a mind boggling feat, uh, in my opinion, when you have such ki kind of, uh, there's a threat of sameness in this art when all the people kind of look the same and all the environments are dark and dim. Right. But nevertheless, this art is so vibrant uh, and it just makes me so happy to look it, at it. It's that, it is that color palette, it is that desolation. And then you see, ah, that looks like a human. <laughs> you're just thankful because you're not filling the frame with human, right? Or some yeah. heroic deed or whatever. You're just yeah. like, ah, that thing's alive. Yeah. <laughs> in all of this wasteland. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to kill me. <laughs> but your eyes definitely drawn to it.